over as a transcript after co-editing. It's your call. Okay, perfect. That, that's wonderful. That's great. Um, so, look, um, what I wanted to do was just very briefly talk about um, just about your own motivation for going into government um, and really about the work that you've been doing um, to improve participation um, there and then, you know, post the pandemic, how that's helped and what that, and what that means. Okay. Great. So I guess the first question is, is what motivated you? What made you make the switch mm -hmm. to move into government? Well, I'm working with the government. I'm not working for the government. So uh, I'm a kind of this Lagrange point between the social movement on one side and the government on the other. And the uh, uh, movement, so to speak, um, has a certain gravity and the government also. And I'm on this kind of balancing point just to make sure that I take all the sides and make sure that the people communicate and listen to each other more effectively. So I guess it's mostly fun that motivates me because uh, it is joyful to me um, to get people who previously not on speaking terms, uh, to be able to see each other side of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And can you tell me a little bit about the work you've been doing um, sure, you know, sure. to improve transparency and, and to improve participation? That's right. So um, in various ways, uh, we make sure that people, because in Taiwan, we have broadband as a human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, you have 10 megabits per second, not just download, but also upload is of no marginal cost, like every month is just a flat rate of 16 US dollars. And in that sense, uh, people don't uh, have to rely only on this media literacy idea where people listen just to radio, television, but anybody can just start broadcasting <laughs> their, their thoughts. And so this is what we call listening at scale, um, meaning that uh, we tour around Taiwan, we listen to the people in their um, natural habitat uh, and uh, do ethnographic, well, just hanging out um, with people. So I tour around Taiwan, participate in those town halls, um, and I use uh, digital means, for example, to uh, broadcast uh, with virtual reality or with a high-definition uh, video to make sure that people in the capital city in Taipei, as well as in other municipalities, join the people uh, in the more rural or indigenous or remote areas to meet kind of face-to-face -face, uh, and talk about their problems um, in a very transparent manner. And I tour around every other week or so. And on Wednesday, I'm in the Social Innovation Lab. Um, and the lab is an open space where anybody can drop by and talk to me for 14 um, or 40 uh, minutes if they're pre-booked uh, it. And uh, um, it's a, a very interesting place, very creative. And uh, I was just looking at a photo where the um, Prague uh, mayor, um, Zdenek Hrib, uh, the yes. pirate, um, he, he just visited Taiwan. He's actually in Taiwan now. I'm going to have lunch with him today. Um, and, and so, as you can see, it's a very creative place. They mm -hmm. uh, all just climbed on this uh, um, uh, blocks and so on. So, um, basically, it's a place that prompts uh, creative thinking. And because everything is on the record, so uh, people who come here to, to lobby me uh, don't uh, make arguments based on selfish arguments. They have to make arguments based on the global goals, the sustainable goals that uh, you see the um, mayor was holding. Uh, and the idea was that uh, people can just add uh, to this kind of puzzle the complete each other. It makes no sense to argue from a purely selfish viewpoint because you know that a lobby in the transcript will be made online. And there's also e-petition where 5,000 people in an e-signature um, can get the Ministry of Responses and we often meet with petitioners. And this is particularly useful for people who are around 15 or 16 years old who are not of age to vote, uh, but they can start movements, for example, to ban plastic straws and things like that. Um, uh, kind of Friday for Future Taiwan style. <laughs> so instead of go to the street, <laughs> they will go to the, the internet, start a petition and work with the circular economy people to make sure that even for our national identity, drink the, the bubble tea. Um, we use, uh, you know, carbon neutral or even uh, carbon capturing materials uh, for circular design uh, for those uh, straws and things like that. There's many more design like presidential hackathon uh, where the president gives five awards every year to people with idea that change the society for the better and basically say whatever you did in the past three months, it could be a app like Pokemon Go that encourage people to refill their bottles instead of uh, using you know plastic bottles that are throw away. Uh, and uh, uh, we say uh, in the next 12 uh, months, um, the president is going to make whatever you did in the past three months uh, a reality by focusing on it as a policy. So it's presidential power as a hackathon award. Just many, many more designs like that. I just cover maybe one fifth, <laughs> but you get an idea. That's wonderful. And and so what have been some of the, the big wins so far? Um, what's come out of it that mm -hmm. has ended up as, as government policy? 
Mm-hmm. Well, a lot. I mean, we we did um, ban gradually uh, plastic uh, mm-hmm. straws, uh, and of course, there's this. Um, well, it's, I guess it's also plastic product, but anyway, um, it's the medical mask, uh, and uh, it's uh, thanks to the Citizens Initiative, a civic technologist whose name is Howard Wu, uh, who showed this map that shows availability of medical mask everywhere in the pharmacy, so people can rest assured that there's plenty of um, medical mask available near them, uh, and so they can just go to a nearby pharmacy, swipe their national health uh, insurance card, um, and see on the Howard Wu and many other people like Finjian Kiang, there's more than 140 different visualizations that the people queuing before them uh, can swipe their card. And nowadays, it's nine medical masks per two weeks or 10 for a child. And you see actually the number decrease on the mask map. And so everybody come to trust um, the infrastructure, not because um, you know people trust the uh, numbers from the government, but actually they can verify before their eyes uh, just by checking uh, the numbers while they're queuing is participatory accountability. So that's reached more than 95% of the Taiwanese population. So we basically develop a vaccine before there's a biological vaccine. We have this physical vaccine. Of course, that's a big win. Yeah, that, that, that's wonderful. What have been the challenges? Um, you know, this is, this is quite a radical sort of approach. Has there been pushback along the way? Well, um, on, on this uh, regard, there's uh, usually two uh, arguments uh, whenever a digital democracy like this uh, is rolled out. One is easier to address is about a digital gap, right? People would say, uh, what if some people in the more rural places, they are not used to digital means of uh, deliberation? What if they don't have broadband connectivity? What if they don't have tablets and things like that? Um, and of course, our solution is simple. Broadband is a human right. You can get a tablet uh, fresh as of the last three years from your local digital opportunity center or library and you don't have to go to our website we come to you uh, to listen to on the town halls and so i think the municipal and more, more rural like township governments eventually see it as something that's augmenting the face-to-face uh, deliberation is not trying to replace the face-to-face uh, relationship so that has been one of the pushbacks and uh, um, another one is that uh, many people will see this kind of deliberation crowdsourcing of ideas and say hey doesn't it make the representatives uh, obsolete um, the legislators uh, previously in 2015 15 or so, um, kind of wondered aloud, like, uh, are we trying to, from the administration, make the legislation of the lead because we will prove that we have the people's mandate um, on the common, you know, how might we questions and the possible solutions. So what about the department? Um, and so we're basically saying design thinking terms, what we're doing is just um, exploring, right, discovering uh, what people's positions and feelings are and defining what are common concerns, like prioritize uh, the agenda. But actually the development and delivery, that is still the parliament's purview uh, because they're in charge of allocating the actual budget and making sure that the laws and regulations work uh, harmoniously uh, with one another. So in a sense, we're just preparing this listening at scale way uh, in a way to augment the legislators' work. Um, and so that plus the referenda laws and plus the uh, four uh, different major parties in our parliament now so- all signed up. Um, it's a very recent thing, like last month, uh, on the open government partnerships, open parliament um, ideas, uh, this manifesto. Uh, they are also now working on their na- uh, national action plans on open government. So after four years or so, I think the parliamentarians no longer see this cross source agenda as a threat um, to their uh, work, but rather as a kind of assistance augmentation of their work. But it wasn't the case in 2014. Mm-hmm. Are there any are there any other countries in the world that have similar approaches that you know of? Do you mm-hmm. collaborate with any, any, any yeah, other of countries? Yeah, of course. We work very closely um, with many other countries uh, because I see myself as just a kind of uh, working with Taiwan, but I'm also uh, on the board of international NGOs that works on this. I'm on the advisory board of GovTa, uh, GovLab um, in, in New York uh, and also uh, Radio Exchange as well. Uh, the Council of Democracy Foundation in Amsterdam, but it originated in Madrid uh, and also uh, the digital Future Society in Barcelona, um, and also we uh, we have a colleague that also works in dark matter labs and working closely with say Nesta um, in the UK. Our e-petition system I just described uh, was a blatant copy of the Better Reykjavik uh, from Iceland. Our um, AI-based listening skill device called Polis is from Seattle. Um, I can go on, but but this is an international movement. Okay, that, that, that's great. And what's next? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So uh, what's next? I think two things, right? Um, uh, my main focus uh, is on getting the more disenfranchised uh, people, and I use people very broadly, um, a say in democracy. So I think uh, this year uh, we're pushing to lower the um, kind of age of consent uh, in order to, uh, I guess, uh, vote in referenda and things like that. Um, in Taiwan, it used to be 20 years old where you can vote, uh, and it's written in the Constitution. Uh, but uh, we're, we're now lowering everything to 18. But even uh, before 18, we're working on the ways that are maximally inclusive. So people, as I mentioned, uh, 13 years old, 12 years old, and so on, have plenty of ways to participate. Uh, and also people who are not uh, born yet, right? Future generations. Um, how do we make sure that they also have a say, uh, of course, by uh, representing their stakes, just like trees and uh, forests and rivers and mountains and so on? They didn't used to have a say. So it's uh, quite possible that in a traditional representative democracy, people will work Work, uh, for the benefit of the current generation to the detriment of future generations. Uh, and so we're uh, exploring ways like through virtual and augmented reality, like speaking to trees, having trees vote. Well, maybe not that quickly, but anyway, <laughs> to, to include the more ecological uh, ways uh, in this um, conversation. So that's one. Uh, and the other um, is that we are making sure that in Taiwan, uh, we're um, building a kind of national um, identity, I guess, around participatory democracy uh, and and that uh, has a, a diplomatic repercussion as well, um, because we're basically saying you don't have to uh, sacrifice human right and democracy in order to counter coronavirus or, uh, you know, work on public health, uh, because we counter coronavirus with no lockdowns. And actually, the democracy deepened uh, because of the rapid iteration cycle. Uh, similarly, we counter the disinformation with no takedowns. You don't have to do a takedown just to uh, hire some uh, professional comedians and do a humor over a rumor, making sure that our clarification are um, hilarious uh, and people share it more than the conspiracy theories and these uh, playbooks basically we, we share for example the cofact uh, project rank of zero uh, that works on this end-to-end -end encrypted line channel um, like like whatsapp uh, that enabled this humor over rumor possibility and um, it's now also running for a year now in thailand uh, in in their own uh, line community we we'll also share the mask map um, with korea uh, people in korea i think many of them are just 12 years old or 14 years old work on the same kind of mass availability map. We're also with uh, Japan and so on. So in a sense, uh, we're solving not only our local problems, like our presidential hackathon, to solve like water leakage and sort of shortage problems, but we also um, document this index and with sustainable development goals and share, say, the Wellington Water Company and so on. So this also has a diplomatic angle in addition to ecological angle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you touched on this, but I guess my final question was really going to be around well, after the pandemic. Um, you know, around the world, people have been willing to trade in freedom um, for public safety and, and Taiwan mm. hasn't had a lockdown but many other countries have. Mm. I mean, how do we use these technologies to make sure that that this incursion into people's freedom doesn't become mm. permanent? Mm. And, you know, as you said, how can people use sort of the keyboard rather than the street um, mm. to, to, to safeguard our rights? Mm -hmm, that's right. Uh, well, we also, also use 5G, so not necessarily cables. But anyway, so uh, <laughs> the 5G phone right there is um, at times uh, more um, actually faster and lower latency than cables, but I digress. <laughs> uh, right. So um, uh, I think there's two things going on. One is that um, just like in Taiwan, we say no to lockdown, not because we're particularly um, averse to lockdowns intrinsically, but because we had lockdowns in 2003. Uh, during SARS 1.0. Uh, and so during SARS 1.0, we had to unexpectedly, surprisingly, lock down an entire hospital with no determinate, um, termination point. Right? Uh, and so it was very traumatic for everybody over 30 years old. Uh, 37 people died directly, 73 people died indirectly because of SARS 1.0. And because of that, uh, the Constitutional Court charged the legislature to uh, develop new laws and regulations and so on, because they say this locking down is just barely, thinly Constitutional. It's almost unconstitutional. Uh, and so we need to find better ways. That's why we developed the Central Epidemic Command Center, which then developed the digital fence and things like that, all to avoid lockdowns. So I think uh, it's important for the society post-COVID to have a conversation that we had in 2004 and 2005 um, to make sure that when SARS 3.0 comes again, because it, it very, very much is a possibility, right? When SARS 3.0 comes again, then people uh, can uh, rest assured that there is like already yearly drills that 
that is already people's understanding around proper mask use. Uh, the good ideas, for example, you wear a mask to protect yourself from your own unwashed hands. That links mask use with soap use um, is uh, just common knowledge uh, for people and so on. So I think the societal inoculation, societal mobilization around better alternatives um, need to be a society-wide conversation as we did uh, right after SARS and we can help. Uh, that is uh, one thing. And the other thing is that because uh, I don't think people will go back to purely face-to-face -face meetings even after COVID um, because people <laughs> now start to see that uh, video conferencing really is a preferable alternative in, in many cases, right? Um, and so I think devices such as this, which is also a 5G device, um, which doubles as a virtual reality device. It doesn't have a controller. I can wear it for hours. Uh, I can just um, you know, control it with my um, hand gestures. So it's very natural for everyone to use. And it has this camera that if I just uh, go around and scan my room, it uh, creates a digital twin of my room so I can invite other people in my room. Um, and so I think uh, the uh, augmented and virtual reality and co-presence that's enabled by 5G technologies is going to take us uh, more into the mood of uh, being really in the same living room um, as other uh, people, but in very different jurisdictions and time zones and so on, so that we do not forget the solidarity that the entire um, globe is working on a common issue together. And we can use this then uh, to work on more structural problems that affects the entire globe, such as climate change, of course, disinformation, I mean, other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. Well, look, thank you so much. I, I, I know we've run just a little bit over time, so no, I'll let you get on with your busy day, um, but mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so you're okay with us just publishing this to YouTube? Yes. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, okay. and, and I'll write this up and share it with you as well. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Yes.